Radix Malorum by Sean Patrick Hazlitt It's been said, the curse of middle age is a man's inability to admit he's reached the peak of his life's parabolic arc, never to rise higher than whatever station he's reached. The longer he rages, the more he struggles against the natural order of things, the more he invites a complete and utter psychotic break. It's only when he surrenders to fate's capriciousness that he begins to find peace, a peace that I will never know. My IQ is 160. By every indication, I'm a genius. Yet, I've been unable to master a world where the Cretans are calling the shots. Take my boss's boss, Alistair Jenkins. The guy's got the attention to detail of an LSD-laced gnat. Yet, he runs the strategy for our company, plotting the trajectory of an organization of 500,000 people. If he has an insight, or more likely, a whim, all those people change course to follow whatever direction he charts. It's insanity, an insanity no one seems to mind so long as the profits keep rolling in. I'm going to murder someone today. The nightmares started three weeks ago. They were different than normal dreams, more vivid, crisper. Every sense was as real to me there as they are in the waking world, oftentimes more real. Night after night, the dream always followed the same pattern. When I slept, I woke in oblivion's sleeve. Suffocating under a shroud of darkness, I spiraled through an infinite vastness. Panic-stricken and desperate, I reached out into the void, seeking a handhold, an anchor to reality. Feeling nothing, I placed my hands where my body should have been, despairing as they slipped through the ether. Eschewing all reason, I flung my discarnate essence further into the abyss. A rectangular sliver of light materialized in the darkness. A doorway to some bizarre dimension. Disregarding all caution, I made my way to the door, anxious to cross its threshold, desperate for sensation, even pain. Passing through the portal, I emerged onto a grand plaza, once again clothed with substance and form. I shivered as a chill wind nipped at my naked flesh. A faceless man, clad in a tuxedo, greeted me with a tilt of his top hat. He carried a red string tethered to a flesh-colored balloon. The balloon had a face. It smiled at me, its mouth curving unnaturally upward like a crescent moon. Though I could not recognize the face, it seemed eerily familiar. The scent of ozone permeated the air. Nimbus clouds gathered over a dull gray horizon. Flashes of lightning cleaved a glowing cicatrix in the heavens. Something sinister swarmed on the plaza's cobblestone surface. The creeping things scurried toward me at a frenetic pace. To what purpose, I did not know. Beyond the carpet of crawling vermin and far in the distance, a great pyramidion hovered above a thousand-foot pentahedron sewn from cyclopean blocks. The pyramidion swiveled in my direction. On its triangular surface, a great eye opened and gazed into my soul. A voice transcendent whispered, 
Novus Ordo Seclorum. I woke in a cold sweat. My alarm was hammering at my eardrums. It was already 9 a.m. When I arrived in the office, my supervisor, Jerry, was waiting at my desk. His arms crossed and his brow furrowed. He made it a point to turn his wrist and glance at his watch. You're late. I'm sorry, uh, won't happen again. I bowed my head in ritual shame, a farce practiced by tardy white-collar cubicle slaves since the dawn of civilization. How are you going to delight the customer when you can't even delight your boss? He said. I grinded my teeth. Whenever Jerry aped corporate jargon, I wanted to gut him with a rusty nail. We were selling software, not stately pleasure domes in Xanadu. You're right, I said, channeling my inner chameleon. Of course I'm right. I'm gonna need to see more from you, Simon. Corporate is looking to cut more costs. If you want to keep your job, I need all hands on deck. You got that? Yes, Jerry, I got it, I said, irritated. Contempt oozed from my voice. Jerry glared at me, then walked away. I booted my laptop. Seconds later, Charlie, an office drone and graphics designer, nattered loudly on his iPhone while walking laps around my open office desk. He made it impossible to concentrate. I felt an overwhelming urge to murder him. The inherent horror of the modern American corporation is that it's optimized to encourage middling men and women to strive harder while simultaneously degrading and dehumanizing them in a mindless march of mediocrity. Once the corporate entity exhausts them through layoffs and natural attrition, it replaces them with resources half a world away. What's worse, today's India is tomorrow's AI algorithm. With all the noise, my attention drifted. My eyes wandered over a sea of wage slaves chained to their computer screens. Then I saw him. Standing against the wall at the far end of the office, the faceless man in the top hat and tuxedo. He approached my desk, then began a mocking march behind Charlie. Tuxedo gripped a crimson string fastened to a balloon holding his face. I now knew what I had to do. No one really talked about what had happened to Charlie. The executive team had made sure of it. The alienation of corporate life made it easier to keep the sheep in the dark. Sure, there were hushed whispers about the two police officers who'd spoken to our CEO, but no one really knew what I knew, what I'd done to him, to his face, to his eyes, to his hands. It's no coincidence that the percentage of psychopaths in corporate management is four times that of the general population. That's why companies are veritable hunting grounds for apex predators like me. And our worship of money makes it all possible. Money is, after all, a god. Without belief, our entire financial system would crumble. I always chuckle at the so-called grown-ups who ridicule cryptocurrency as fake money. All money is fake. It is only faith that confers it power. If not for my dark dreams, 
I never would have experienced this awakening. It was easier to make money when you didn't care about hurting people. It was even easier if you thrived on torturing them. It was time to channel this impulse, harness it to fuel my rise. That night, I returned to the plaza. Tuxedo led me toward the slithering masses. As I drew closer, their shapes resolved into a glorious vision. As far as I could see, a wave of disembodied hands surged forward, forming a writhing wall around me and obscuring my vision of the Pyramid God. A blood-red eye on the palm of each hand regarded me with a fierce and godlike intelligence. The voices they projected into my consciousness threatened to overwhelm me, to annihilate my sense of self. So many songs, so many memories, so many paths. Unchained from the mundane insignificance of my mortal coil, I had finally found my purpose, my true calling. Mammon was its name. I came to work early. I watched with glee as Tuxedo danced around Jerry, my conventional reality slowly melting like tallow beneath a flame. Tuxedo's meat balloon bobbed up and down, its mouth curling in an awful rictus. I smiled too then offered to buy Jerry lunch. Alistair seemed reluctant to promote me, even if only temporarily. I could see it in his idiot eyes. I really couldn't blame him. I wasn't a glad-hander like he was. To me, people were taxing. I used to avoid them unless interaction was absolutely required. Now, I actively sought them out, especially if their culling would increase my personal collection while simultaneously improving the corporation's profit margin. The trick was not to exterminate the highest performing salespeople. This annoyed me, since the best of them tended to be the most insufferable. But money was money, after all. As Alistair droned on about our corporate mission and Blue Ocean strategy, his smarmy smile began to drip off like three flavors of melting sherbet. His face followed. By the time it was a flesh-colored puddle on the linoleum tiles, he dismissed me, closing his office door for a very important call. Through the glass wall, I could see Tuxedo standing behind Alistair's desk. The face on his flesh balloon winked at me. While tempting, I decided to save Alistair for later. For now... I only sacrificed those who wouldn't be missed. Office gossip suggested a murderer was in our midst. I shrugged it all off. They'd never catch me. They couldn't catch me. My reality was fluid. Time was a recursive tree, its pathways branching out and folding back into themselves. The trick was not to get caught up in an infinite feedback loop that shattered reality. I could simultaneously be at my desk pretending to work and elsewhere peeling off Alistair's face. Reality is a Rorschach test, an ink blot on the ethereal plane. The sheep can only interpret it. 
but the artist, peering down from the higher dimensions, has the power to shape how that ink blot is rendered. But that's not the point. The point is that I was coming up in the world at exactly the moment when most people had already reached the summit of their pathetic lives. Today, they escorted me out of the office, my position eliminated. I laughed at the fat sow from HR who read my notice mechanically from a script. When Tuxedo and his face arrived, I giggled hysterically. She shifted in her seat, seemingly unsettled by my reaction. As she stood up, I placed my hand on hers and said, I'm going to bind your soul. Her face went ashen. She stormed out. In her wake, security surged into the room. I had so much fun that day, exploring hundreds of permutations of the event. In one path, I carved off her face. In another, I tracked her home and sliced her and her husband into tiny pieces. Later that night, I stalked Alistair through the tenderloin. He resisted, killing me many times. Although a gambler may win a round or two, like the house, I always win. In an abandoned alley, I stretched his intestines across the opening of a decrepit recycling bin and strummed a delicious dirge. Then I added the best parts of him to my collection. Greetings, kiddos. Here I stand in a twilight realm, straddling the crossroads of recursive time, dressed in a tuxedo and top hat, awaiting myself. The skin of my face is stretched taut and paper thin, floating on the tendon tether of a flesh balloon distended with my essence. There are many more of us in your reality than you can possibly imagine. We maim and kill at will, then conveniently edit the timeline as if it never happened. In this reality, at least. For an incident can never be erased. Its stain forever befouls the fabric of the cosmos. Much like the fickle corporate titan, we sometimes experiment with objective reality. Explore how the cattle react to a world inundated with abattoirs. Something to ponder as you go about your Sisyphean labors of existence. Welcome to the New World Order. Fare thee well. From the third edition of Metaphysical Pathologies of the Criminally Insane by Dr. Irving Werther. For months, Simon DeWeese, otherwise known as the Corporate Carver, had eluded authorities, leaving a trail of mutilated bodies throughout San Francisco. It was after they received a note confessing his crimes that police raided his studio apartment in the Tenderloin. According to Detective Joseph de Alessio, DeWeese had sliced off his victims' faces, removed their eyes, and severed their hands. Authorities had never been able to recover any of these body parts. When police entered DeWeese's apartment, they uncovered a wall of hands with eyes sewn into the palms. More disturbingly, in one of the most macabre displays in San Francisco murder history, the skin of his victims' faces had been tanned and stretched into balloons floating in his apartment. 
Deweese's body was found in his bed, dressed in a tuxedo and wearing a top hat. He had skinned off his face and, like the others, inflated it into a balloon. Anonymous sources revealed that several members of the city's moneyed elite had urged the San Francisco Police Department to keep one particular aspect of the case under wraps. On Deweese's wall, scrawled in blood, was a mantra that was then becoming all too common in an epidemic of what appeared to be copycat murders. Radix malorum est cupiditas.